Hello and welcome back to the One Take Show podcast. In this episode, we are in conversation with a very special guest. Our guest today is Mr. Devish Kumar. Sir is a partner leading a litigation team in Luthra and Luthra Partners. And in this episode, we talk about something very incredible. We talk about litigation, but with the experience of chamber practice all the way to the law firm practice. Obviously, we talk about the benefits, the differences. We dig deep into the values that we can derive out of sir's own experience. Apart from this, we also discuss discuss a brilliant IBC judgment that is Abix Singapore versus Educomp. Uh, the same is linked down in the description. So if you want to read the judgment, please straight away hit the link in the description. Apart from that, ladies and gentlemen, I truly believe that this is one of the finest conversations I've had on this podcast. So detailed and so much value can be driven out of this conversation, which will benefit a lot of people. So if you find this conversation useful, please make sure to like, share and subscribe. Also share this video with someone you believe can benefit from this conversation. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, let's start with the podcast. You want something? Go get it. Period. Recording three, two, and one. Hello, sir. Welcome to the One Take Show. This is possibly one of the greatest moments of this podcast. I am such a huge, huge fan. Uh, you are an inspiration for every law student, everyone who's interested either in litigation or pursuing a career that creates an own landmark. And everyone who follows the footstep would learn so much from this episode. I'm really grateful for your presence here. Thank you so much for sitting down with me for this episode. Thank you so much for having me. And I think you're being far too kind, uh, more than I deserve. But uh, thank you so much. Uh, you're, you're very kind when you say that. You've had some great people on your show. So I'll do my best to make it, uh, you know, live up to the expectation of your viewership as well, because uh, you have a huge viewership as well. So I hope I can live up to that expectation because you have interviewed some brilliant people. And uh, so there is a lot of pressure on me as well now. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not, sir. I think uh, uh, when when it comes down to an episode like this, it's very, very enriching for everyone who's listening to this, especially because of all the law students or fresh legal graduates who've graduated in the last couple of years or who are going to graduate in the next couple of years. Uh, keeping in mind the kind of market that we have and the situations that are changing, it's very important that we take inspiration from all the leaders in the industry. On that note, sir, I think I have a tradition where I very specifically ask my guests as to what have been their experience with the legal industry so far uh, what was your journey with law what inspired you uh, to first of all start with law and to stick with law for so long and what has been your major experience that has somehow shaped you professionally uh, so uh, like many of us you know even I'm a first generation lawyer uh, there is no background in law I, I have uh, you know there is nobody from my family uh, except for some of my cousins who are also now first generation lawyers uh, but they're settled abroad and uh, some of them are not even practicing law. So uh, I was, I, I would I consider myself as a first generation lawyer. So how it all started was that uh, I did my schooling. My father was in the army. So I have, uh, you know, traveled the length and breadth of the country and uh, I studied in places like Leh Ladakh and uh, Wellington. And then when the Kargil war broke out, my father was posted in a forward area. Uh, in Ganganagar and uh, you know, due to certain circumstances, I had no option but to uh, you know, shift to Republic of Ireland where one of my aunts, my Masi stays and uh, she, you know, I, I grew up there and she looked after me and my two cousins there. So I spent about four years there, but I always wanted to come back to uh, India and uh, this is where I felt that, you know, this is where I want to be. And initially there was no plan of doing law at all. Uh, I had thought that, you know, probably I'll be a shippy, I'll get into Merchant Navy or something like that. Then uh, my grandfather, my maternal grandfather, uh, he got me this book of uh, John Grisham. I still remember the firm. I found it very interesting, you know, the legal world and everything. And then, so he said, why don't you give it a try? You know, and I'll be very honest with you, medical was my bus. I tried that. I paper I said, this is my bus. So uh, I said, this sounds interesting. And... Uh, John Grisham had a lot of expectations on the next level. Pe le gaye the wo to. And uh, then, at that time, there was a law school tutorial. At that time, there was no CLAT. So, there was a law school tutorial. So, they saw some papers. They saw logical reasoning ke papers and legal reasoning ke papers. Bade interesting bade. So, then I said, let's try this. You know, uh, it didn't happen in my national law school. Uh, but then, I got into Army Institute of Law, Mohali. And that I loved every minute of the time that I spent in uh, that college. And that is how I got into law, to be very honest. Then 
I always had a mindset towards uh, you know getting into litigation, but due to certain circumstances or whatever was the reason, I ended up with a job. I had a PPO from the small corporate. Uh, a uh, boutique corporate law firm uh, i started working with them i worked with them for about 3 years and wonderful people to work with and i uh, had some wonderful colleagues there but us time pe bhi na mera inclination hamesha litigation ki taraf tha so i said i want to get into litigation and i have to try it you know? i i didn't want to live with the regret that you know 30 years 40 years down the line you know however well you may be earning but if you have not tried it you know then you feel a little bad ki yaar ye try nahi kiya so i wanted to get into litigation now the corporate job had given me that corporate law firm had given me that comfort of a salary you know uh, for good salary a decent salary i'll consider it now to take a jump and you know i was married also so uh, to take that plunge ki acha kya karna hai kaise karna hai that was a little uh, that was something that uh, you know i was not very keen on doing that you know suddenly that plunge from uh whatever that salary was to uh, whatever the litigators you know generally the chamber practice mein jo milta hai so i decided i'll interview with law firms and all uh, and i'll try to get into a law firm initially fortunately or unfortunately i considered it fortunately mera hua hi nahi i i tried i i got it i interviewed with luthra and luthra also in 2013 i interviewed with some of the top uh, law firms and mera hua hi nahi they very were they were very clear they said boss you don't have any experience in litigation and uh, we want somebody with experience you spent 3 years and uh, you know i'm sorry so fortunately i would say ki wo mera hua nahi and then this opening came up in this chambers of mr sudhir makkar and he started me off with this salary of 15000 he said ki this is what i can pay and us 15000 mein se 8000 to tel mein chale jata tha because we used to be going from one district court to another district court we used to be covering about three district courts but what i learned in his chamber i will be very honest with you i am grateful to god that mera us time pe nahi hua tha because that trial court experience because see there is a difference in the chamber practice and the and the law firm practice in the law firm you get a lot of matters which are you know there are good high stake matters i'm i'm sure this is this is in no manner uh, please don't consider as a disrespect to the chamber uh, lawyers bilkul nahi they do some wonderful jobs but now these big ticket matters in a, in a in a large sense they come to these big law firms so as a junior you don't get that exposure of appearances so much in the law firms per se initially i'll be very honest with you so if i hadn't gotten that exposure uh, for instance conducting trial uh, doing cross examinations doing final arguments uh, filing of applications and everything i i don't think uh, i would have been the lawyer that i am today if it wasn't for that chamber number one again with the caveat there is no disrespect for the, to the law firms at all i'm i'm part i'm working with a law firm and i love each and every minute uh, of the time i spend here thereafter i i worked with mr makkar for about one one and a half year and uh, then obviously because 15000 was a little less and also because i wanted more exposure in the high court so i i had a very frank conversation with him i said that listen this is what i want to do and he says you know go ahead if you want to join someone else please do and uh, then i applied to mr krishnendu datta's office uh, and i joined his office there and there i got a lot of exposure on uh, uh, on the writ jurisdiction side in the delhi high court so they had this electricity tribunal ka panel and uh, he had about i think 16 juniors and we had a cause list of about 30 36 mr datta himself was in some court uh, then he had two partners mr manish shrivastava being one of them he was also in some other court so every junior got an opportunity of appearing and doing uh, you know proper arguments and everything in the high court or name any forum we were we were everywhere so that was another thing that helped in uh, developing my confidence as well uh, the regular appearances thereafter i decided that you know i worked with him for about one month another one month and a half year and then at that point in time i had some of my own clientels as well and you know i i wanted to do their work as well i decided to then uh, you know go independent for a bit i started my own i i was fortunate uh, there was this client of mine he was a chartered accountant so one day i was we were discussing his case and uh, you know i told him that listen i'm looking to go independent if you have an office uh, in mind that i can you know take i can take on rent uh, do let me know so he said mere office mein ek kamra khali hai tum udhar aa jao so i said badhiya hai so he says you how much are you willing to pay 
through a friends and family i got introduced to a few people and then i kept uh, doing independent work but then a part of me felt that you know i'm not getting that exposure that i want with regard to big ticket matters and whatever said and done i don't blame so there were a few clients of mine they were big companies they would always come to me for advice but when they wanted to execute the work they would always come to a big firm so i still remember there was this uh, meteorological act ka ek matter tha we spent about 15 20 days discussing the law and you know doing everything but finally jab execution ki bari aayi so they said you know we are going to a law firm so i asked them i said was it the fee court that i quoted because you know as a chamber practicing lawyer to me laga ki maine kya fee court zyada mang li or what it was they said no they said you know when it comes we want to go with a name that tomorrow if there is some problem or the other you know even we take a proper stand and you know we can justify to the board that why we have gone with someone who does not have a name versus someone who has a name so that is that is when i realized that you know if if i want to be associated with uh, you know big companies uh, i do have to have uh, you know a probably a brand backing with me so that is how i ended up applying at luthra and luthra and this time i was very fortunate that they took me to be very honest and for them the experience that i had Uh, over the past seven years, that mattered to them a lot, and that is how I felt it was easier for me that after seven years, from a fresh year after seven years of practice, to get into a law firm, uh, that that I felt was uh, the difference. So that is how I uh, ended up at Luthra and Luthra, and then I've been here for about five years now. Mm-hmm. And so far, it has been quite good. I'm doing some uh, interesting matters. Uh, you name the field, I'm working on it. and uh, it's it's interesting it's very interesting the journey has been uh, a lot of fun but right. in no way this does not discredit the people who continue with chambers because i'll be very honest with you it's commendable i have some of my friends who are uh, you know who left law firms to start their independent practice and they are doing extremely well so maybe i say that you know maybe i didn't have the patience but i think it works out well for everyone whatever path they do, you know move on so this is what i feel in the end what you have to do is that what your your heart wants you to go ahead with yeah right. listen to your heart <laughs> right sir i think yeah. as uh, first of all i absolutely loved every minute of this segment of the conversation primarily because i personally also am an ed- litigation enthusiast and this to hear a story coming from someone who's also a first generation lawyer and to somehow meddle with the similar kind of issues that we somehow foresee because of our immaturity we still foresee that okay if i'm a first generation lawyer should i start with the litigation chamber but then obviously uh, the sustenance economically it's not very viable for everyone should i strive for a law firm participate in a team um, but from your experience what stood out for me and what i also would love to follow up on is that when you when you distinguish the practice of let's say a corporate law firm or a litigation team or leading a litigation team and there are juniors that you lead and these juniors are somehow sometimes freshers sometimes they are experienced what are your expectations from these juniors would you uh, rather uh, somehow want a junior who is experienced with the trial court or someone who is a fresher who wants to join a litigation uh, team in a law firm and wants to uh, adjust adjust to the uh, kind of business that a law firm does is there is there a, a preference on that front or something that you believe is a better route uh, for the career that can somehow shape you possibly as a better candidate when it comes down to choices see i don't think there is any hard and fast rule uh, per se that you know what will help you uh, improve your career per se uh, there are a lot of people who start off with chambers they do extremely well and uh, you know whatever said and done a lot of senior advocates i don't think any of them you know not many of them even started off with firms and they're doing extremely well and a lot of these law firms they go and brief uh, these senior advocates as well now coming to your question yes definitely it does help that uh, you know somebody has some trial court experience or has about 3 years or 4 years under his belt and he does come because obviously it makes it easier uh, for the person you know you're going to be reporting to or you're going to be working with but 
I would not say that that is only the case with a law firm. Even if let's say you go to a chamber, anybody would prefer it that you know somebody who comes here with at least three years of experience or something like that. But at the same time, I would not say that you know uh, there is there is no hope for the freshers, you know, because everyone has to start somewhere. So my advice would be that you know be first of all don't be disappointed with regard to rejection. The number of rejections, if I tell you that you know the number of rejections that I have faced. the one thing that i have learned is that probably this was not meant for me something better was uh, you know uh, there in the future for me probably that is that is how i see it so be optimistic at the same time be really dedicated to your work because jaise no 3 idiots ke mein kehte hai na ki paise ke piche mat bhago kaam badhiya karo things will itself happen for you i still remember when i gave up my uh, job in uh, that corporate law firm i did not have I, and I, after that i started to interview with the, the law firms and all to try and get a job i did not have any work for 6 months and this opportunity came uh, to me that you know somebody wanted they wanted to file a summary suit and obviously sabne mere ko is baat pe reject kiya tha ki bhai tumhare paas to koi litigation ka experience hi nahi hai and litigation experience mein practical experience also matters a lot so maine apni taraf se pura padh ke gaya tha i still remember uh, order 37 sorry not section 37 order 37 ke upar mein padh ke gaya tha एंड मैंने क्लाइंट को बताया मैंने कहा ये तो समरी सूट है ये ऐसे हो जाता है ऐसे हो जाता है ऐसे हो जाता है अगर मैंने प्रैक्टिकल एक्सपीरियंस मेरे पास होता तो पहली चीज मैं बताता कि ऑर्डर थर्टी सेवन में ना सबसे ज्यादा डिले इसी में होता है ठीक है एंड वट एवर आई विल नॉट गेट इन टू द लॉ बट काफी डिले उसमें हो जाता है बट दैट इज समथिंग दैट आई लर्न यू नो एज आई हैव प्रोग्रेस्ड इन माई करियर एंड यू नो विद टाइम एंड एवरीथिंग बट एट द सेम टाइम i was in a position to advise not advise but discuss that with the client because i kept reading on it i kept reading on it so you have to be at it you cannot be satisfied even after about 20 years or 30 years of your career this is a field you take ibc the topic we're going to be discussing today now this is this code is ever evolving every day there is a new interpretation and i love this thing about law every day there is some new interpretation because somebody has a different idea so you have to be at it you have to just see that how the interpretation is being done you have to be at it and when i say you keep reading don't just restrict it to law because our field is such that you know somewhere or the other there is this human element so read whatever you can read read fiction read on philosophy do whatever you can just read just enjoy if you don't enjoy reading so much get into documentaries but just just keep yourself abreast with whatever is happening in the world some way or the other it just comes to help you so as a fresher just keep reading just keep reading everything will some day or the other just come together and it will help you probably 10 years down the line you will never know so that is how i see it right sir i think this is very interesting from the perspective of a final year law student and i'm sure like a majority of my viewership is final year law students uh, there is a perception especially that comes with the fear of missing out that there is a certain kind of winning after the law school and losing like if you get a, a particular job in certain place or a certain position then you you've sort of like qualified uh, through that winning uh, position but you've not from your story what i understand is that there is absolutely no certainty of the same it just so that it evolves with the experience and after so after only possibly looking back at it you can realize whether that experience was fruitful or not and uh, with that experience so if we talk about your experience either in litigation uh, as a chamber practice or as a uh, team leader in uh, in one of the most prestigious law firms in india what has been the major challenges that you faced and were there any challenges which were so significant that they uh, shaped you professionally and personally as well <clears throat> see i i will not say challenges i always look at it as an opportunity per se uh i think that in my entire career so far and i still feel i'm quite young in the profession uh, so far it's it's been very interesting i'll be very honest with you from the time that you know i was working in a chamber to when i had my own chamber and uh, even coming to the law firm so the first thing that i noticed the difference is that you know you have is that the law firm gives you an infrastructure which i as an independent practitioner could not afford to be very honest but as an independent practice now the benefit of that not having that infrastructure was that initially i was doing my own filing i was doing my own case law research i did not have any interns or anything so the benefit that i had was i understood how filing is done now it is very important even as a fresher or 
whatever, even if you are three years down in the profession, you should know how the filing happens. You should start from the grassroots level to understand that, you know, how things are done, how the filing is done in court. What are the objections that can take place? Because tomorrow, if you have to tell your client, yeah, yeah, file ho jayega. Then, kal wo file nahi client ga, yeah, file kyun nahi So that experience, whatever said and done, there is an experience in everything that you do. So take up whatever activity that comes up. And that is something that all of us must, must do. You know. So the difference now, uh, if, if I may see from the chamber and to the law firm is there are a few. First of all, the practice of law does not change. What you're practicing in the chambers is the same thing that you're practicing in the law. Law firms may, there is this perception that, you know, everything is so fancy. There is, yes, there are some big ticket litigations that are going on, which may not be going on in chambers. But the advantage that you get in a chamber is definitely that bulk uh, of the matters that you're doing. There is so much of experience. And every time, if you may notice that every time you step into court, however well prepared you may be, there, there may be an instance where something new may crop up, which will then, you know, you will start to think that, all right, how do I sort out this issue? So that is the challenge. That is the opportunity, which brings you back on the drawing board. You start with the talo, chalo, CPC, kholo, evidence, deko, how do we interpret this? And that is, that is what I feel it you know, it forms or it helps in, uh, you know, making your career, the number of court appearances that you have, especially as a litigating lawyer. Now in the, in the law firm as well. Now I, as uh, in, in my team, we also focus a lot on, uh, we focus a lot on uh, the appearances for us. It is very important to be in court because we feel, you know, a little out of touch with law if we are not in court on a daily basis. But one benefit then I'll see also with the law firm is that the pool of talent that you have on the, uh, you name the field. For instance, now there was one arbitration that we were doing. And then we had a question with regard to tax that is it even feasible what this particular witness is saying? You know, is that even practical? So immediately we got in touch with our tax partner and then we discussed this with, with him and then he gave us a solution. So the big advantage of working with a with a law firm is that you have you have capital markets, you have competition teams, you have income tax, and and everyone's experience, some way or the other, can be utilized for the client. So which is which is one big advantage that the law firms definitely do have. That is one thing that I do feel. But on the other side, I feel the chamber. The other advantage that they give you is with the regular appearances, the ability to hone your court craft. So I think that you know whatever opportunity you get. Just make the best use of it, be it in the law firm, even if you're coming as a fresher in the law firm, make the best use of it, even if you're starting as a fresher in a chamber, because whatever said in that destiny has a big role to play. Just because you started in a chamber, don't think that, yes, I, you know, as you said that, you know, some feel that you know, they have failed or they're it's a winning and losing game. Because in my college as well, initially I started with a small law firm. There are some colleagues of mine, there are some friends of mine who started with a big law firm. There were some of them who didn't get a job. They started. They, they started with a small chamber where they didn't even get paid. And 15 years down the line, 12 years down the line, is how we see it is the ones who started off in a chamber, they're doing extremely well. Everyone is doing well. Everyone has their own journey. Whatever opportunity you get, make the best use of it. Don't compare yourself with anyone else. You have to just compare yourself with how you were one year back. If you haven't improved, go back on the drawing board, figure out why you haven't improved and try and do better. That is how I feel it. Yeah. That sounds like a perfect motto for every law student who's trying to improve. I think uh, I'll very quickly jump on to the last question in this segment because I really believe that if uh, the statements come directly from you, it will create a different kind of an impact. If you were to talk to any junior of yours, any intern, or any fresh legal graduate or even a law student who's trying to follow your footsteps, what kind of advice would you give out to them and what are the major, from your leadership mentorship roles that you've had in the past, what would be the major guidances that you could point out for their betterment? I think a majority of uh, what I would want to say here, I've already covered in the past uh, in, in, your, uh, in your previous question. But what I would just, just add here is speak to as many people as you can. Now, what you're hearing from me is my experience. Speak to someone who is, who is a proper homegrown product of the law firm. He'll have a different experience altogether. Speak to as many people as you can and then arrive at the conclusion that, you know, this is what I want to do and this is what I feel is the right thing for me. But please make sure that don't, when you're making that decision, please do not look at it only from the monetary perspective. Because sometimes what happens is, because what, what may happen is that, all right, if you're looking at it from a monetary perspective, 
you may see that all right this is the best choice for me but maybe in the long run you may not learn so much or it may not you may not be inclined to do that work because for instance now coming back to my example again i started out with a well paying job in a corporate law firm wonderful people to work with but i didn't enjoy the job and i was not growing as a lawyer i felt and then i jumped into litigation and i really loved that work every day was a new day it felt like a new day i was you know i was eager to get out of my bed into the court and i just loved that work so don't look at it only from that microscopic view ki acha mera thoda loan hai monetary ye hai everything works out just look at it from the perspective this is something that i will enjoy and this is what i want to do and be focused on it right wonderful sir i think if i if i were to have a conversation on this this recording would never stop i would keep taking the rabbit hole and trying to get as much as i can but uh, in the interest of the time and i'm sure like i'm really grateful for the time that you have given to me for this podcast uh, i would also love to discuss something that we've agreed upon as a theme and uh, it's something that is so interesting uh, for all the viewers the link of this judgment is down in the description anyone who wants to read this judgment can go through that link uh, we are talking about abex Sim- uh, singapore versus educorp um all the facts will be explained to you in the previous video in this one particular segment my first question to you sir is that the judgment has somehow shed a spotlight on the adjudicating mechanism um under the code how do you assess the uh, the impact of the same on the resolution applicants who then participate in the process which consents to be bound by the rfp uh, rfrp and uh, what is the broad insolvency framework impact from this entire change that you observe see while when you're going over this judgment see the main reason the, the crux behind this judgment was that whether a, a successful uh, not a successful resolution applicant but someone whose resolution plan has been approved by the committee of creditors and he's you know waiting for his plan to be approved can he withdraw his uh, uh, resolution plan keeping in mind certain circumstances there is delay and this is a question that comes up a lot in uh, many of matters that some of them even we are doing so there is this client of ours about uh, in 2018 i remember uh, they th- their resolution plan had been approved by the coc now fortunately unfortunately it takes a lot of time you know uh, in our case it was taking a lot of time for the resolution uh, plan to be approved by the adjudicating authority and they were actually considering withdrawing it because they felt that you know the viability of the plan was being affected and this is a question and this is a problem that a lot of people are facing and even in this particular judgment uh, they have faced uh, it's clear it's it's very clear that they have also uh, faced this issue now the question is that whether they are bound by the rfrp or not see rfrp as a document is basically your request for uh, a resolution plan and somewhat it is like one of those uh, documents wherein you are inviting you know those tender documents wherein you are inviting a proposal so you are bound by the terms and conditions you have to see how the rfrp is also framed rfrp is you know it's it's prepared with the consent of the coc and it gives you a timeline that all right this is the timeline within which the resolution plan has to be uh, prepared now how do you go about preparing a resolution plan because there is this thing called you know kv tempter you should be aware about what you're getting into so they give you an opportunity of doing a due diligence they give you an opportunity of doing a uh, search on the data and everything and whatever information that the rp is has been able to get his hands on that is all put forth before you and you're given an opportunity to do your proper diligence so that you can then come up with a proper plan because the intent here is again what you have to look at is the intent of the court that it is to ensure that this concern ongoing concern does not end up in liquidation and it can continue probably in a new management so this opportunity is given to the resolution applicant and obviously there are certain conditions that are put forth there are certain timelines that are uh, that have to be followed and if there is a clarification that is required which results in the amendment of the rfrp then obviously there has to be a level playing field and again obviously another rfrp is issued so to that extent yes the rfrp the the resolution uh, applicant whoever are the resolution uh, applicants whoever floats their resolution plans they are bound by the conditions of the rfrp because you have to have that level playing field as you also have in those uh, matters in which tenders are floated now uh, your second part was with regard to the implementation of the yes. uh, plan is it mm-hmm. now coming to the implementation of the plan once the coc approves the plan now this question comes up is that you know is is this approval by coc binding on 
the resolution uh, applicant, the successful resolution applicant whose uh, whose plan has been approved by the majority. Now, although yes, EBEX to an extent does clarify it, but uh, what I do feel is that, you know, as we have seen in IBC, this code is ever evolving and maybe this issue may even be dealt with by the legislature at a later extent, uh, at a later point in time, maybe. So how what has happened in EBEX is because once now there is this time period, as rightly put by you, there is this time period between the COC having approved it and while the uh, resolution plan is pending uh, for approval under Section 31 before the adjudicating authority. Now, what happens during this timeline is the question that whether he can withdraw it. Now, very interesting arguments have been made in this and which point towards the fact that once it has been approved by the COC, this plan is binding, you cannot wriggle out of it. And you don't only have to look at the sections and the regulations uh, in the IBC to arrive at that conclusion at present. I will say that at present, but you also have to look at the scope and objectives of the code. Why the code came into the place? Why was there a need to have a process wherein everything will be completed in a time-bound manner? If you do not complete it within this time-bound manner, then the result is liquidation. Because the first intent here has to is to ensure that that company can be continued as an ongoing concern. So which is why it is important to have a particular timeline. Now coming to the question that why is it important to not allow a successful uh, resolution applicant uh, or in this scenario, how we would put it is a resolution applicant whose plan has been approved by the COC to wriggle out of the uh, plan that he has submitted. If you allow that, then the complete object and scope of the code will be defeated. Because what has happened here is that people have spent, you know, COC has spent their time, money has been spent, the resolution professional has also spent time, even the RA has spent time, and they have finally concluded that this is the plan wherein the creditors, the money of the creditors will also be to an extent returned, and this will also, uh, you know, help in the viability of the project, and they will be in a better position to bring this company back on its feet. Now, if at that stage you allow somebody to get out of it, then this entire process goes for a six. And then you have no other choice but to send it into liquidation, which is not, you know, which is not the actual intent with which you started the entire process. To avoid that, they also have this concept of performance guarantee. If you read uh, regulation 36B, so they also say that you may. Now what they say is that you may also ask for a performance uh, guarantee, wherein if the person tries to wriggle out of it, you know, you can enforce that performance guarantee. So how I saw it was that you're right, all right. So there is, it's not a hard and fast rule to say that, you know, you cannot wriggle out of it because they have this concept of performance guarantee. And as was argued in EBICS as well, that uh, it is only when the plan is approved under section 31 and you do not follow it, there are repercussions under section 74. Although the Supreme Court has taken a different view, how they have uh, interpreted it is that, if the law does not provide for something, the judiciary cannot be interpreting that law to provide for that omission. So on that basis, what they have said is that if you look at the timelines as well, there is a timeline within which the information memorandum has to be sent out. There is a timeline within which the uh, due diligence has to be done. There is a timeline within which the RFRP has to be uh, you know, floated. There is a timeline within which the committee of creators you know, not in that same order, but the committee of creditors has to be formed. There is even a timeline for, if required, to amend the RFRP as well. But there is no mention of any timeline for withdrawal of it, of the uh, of the plan. So the judicial intent, how the judgment uh, uh, has interpreted it, the judicial intent was never to allow someone to withdraw it. So this is how EBIX takes it. That is that, that is that is how I'm seeing this judgment. No, I'm no, very no. honest with you. That's that's actually very insightful. So because although you've somehow already covered this, but for the sake of clarity, do you do you also think that there is a concern regarding courts possibly oscillating on their stance when it comes to this issue? Or, or and I or think it's a very it, good issue, right, sir? So no, no, sir. I'm so sorry for cutting you. Yeah. No, no. So that's that's what my question is essentially. Do you also believe that there is an oscillation on the stance, or has the courts been rather consistent, but it's somehow evolving in a nature or 
बना दिया था सी वन हैज टू बी माइंडफुल ऑफ द प्रॉब्लम्स दैट द लिटिगेंट इज आल्सो फेसिंग यू नो uh as i as i mentioned in the beginning even my client has faced this issue that you know it's taking about 16 months for instance there was one plan of ours uh, from the cirp process uh, it was at the 530th day that the resolution plan was finally approved by the adjudicating authority and there is no blame on the judiciary i'll be very honest with you that i'm not putting any blame on anyone but all right yes even the courts are overburdened and more than anything you know even as lawyers we also file a lot of applications because everyone is looking at the interest of the client you know that you know this needs to be done or that needs to be done there is some objection that needs to be filed there is some person who feels that you know they are aggrieved by the fact that you know that plan has been approved and there is some stay or the other because in the end you have to see that you know justice is done in the end now if during that entire process this is this is my personal opinion i'm i'm not uh, talking about this judgment per se but if let's say during this entire process the timeline that is spent affects the viability of that plan then that is something which is again defeating the purpose of the court this is my interpretation i'll be very honest with you because what is also the intent of the court intent is also to ensure maximization of the assets now if the assets are themselves depreciating the resolution applicant let's say for no fault of his the matter is being delayed for whatever reasons let's say not attributable to him but there is some application that is pending pandemic has happened or whatever it is the viability of the plan comes into the question then granting such a person or such a company uh, make declaring him as a successful resolution applicant and then tomorrow he comes up and says that sorry i'm not in a position to you know continue with this you may end up facing another situation wherein the successful resolution applicant is probably facing at a situation of insolvency and that is something that you don't want so i do feel that probably legislature must also dwell into this but at the same time i do understand that why you do not have this provision as on date because of the fact that you know we have had our experience from the insolvency of 1920 act and sika sarfezi and everything this code whatever said and done yes the creditors are getting their money with the haircut but at least they are getting something out of it you know otherwise india was a market that you know everyone was saying that you know boss getting into this market is one thing but to get your money out is you know absolutely difficult so this is another thing that we have to keep in mind now coming on that oscillating uh, the question that you have asked the oscillating stance it is very important to have this because why is there an oscillation first of all we have to understand because one size does not fit all every time a case is filed every one will have a different interpretation which is why as i said this code is ever evolving now if you may recall initially there was the section 12 which said that the time period is 180 days plus another 90 days which was total 270 days they realized that this is not possible but at the same time they had to ensure that it has to be done in a time bound manner which is why in 2019 there was an amendment and there was an introduction wherein they said that this entire process has to be finished in 330 days so this is how that amendment came up why did that amendment came up yes there were judgment which said that sorry without beyond 180 days or 270 days you cannot go forth and then from those judge uh, from similar examples came another set of judgment wherein the question of principle of exclusion also came up so this is how law is then you know comes up to be uh, law evolves to be very honest another instance that comes to my mind is introduction of section 12a in the uh, uh, insolvency and bankruptcy code which was an amendment uh, and uh, which was an amendment in 2018 i think wherein now earlier what was happening was that there were certain section 7s filed section 9s filed uh, say, uh, wherein uh, uh, if let's say uh, once they were allowed immediately the company would go into insolvency and initially the, the debt was also not so much and if somebody wanted to settle there was no provision per se so everyone was filing an application under rule 11 that you know allow us to settle this is the intent we'll continue to go realizing that there is no provision per se now similar interpretation could have been given as is being given in ebex that the judicial intent is not to give that because if there is an omission there is a willful omission the judiciary cannot give that but instead the legislature came back with an amendment and they said all right if let's say with the 90% Uh, uh confirmation of the coc if let's say a matter can be settled we'll settle it and finish it off because again you have to come back to the intent of the code which is to ensure that you know the maximization of the assets and probably it is better to give it back to the 
uh, original corporate debtor, if you feel that, you know, all right, he has settled all his debt, there is nothing left. Why do you want to continue with the CIRP process? So that is how even 12A came into being. So maybe, you know, I don't know, maybe later we will also have an amendment with regard to this, uh, that, you know, this is something they will probably even set up certain guidelines or probably certain uh, grounds on which you can uh, allow for withdrawal uh, before the approval of the Section 31. You never know. So, but as on date, this is what the law is. And uh, mm -hmm. this is what is there. Right. Sir. Because I, I remember you telling me that the best, one of the many good things about IBC is that it keeps evolving. And even today it's evolving. And uh, one very curious aspect about this was that IBC per se does not envisage uh, the binding nature of, let's say, a resolution plan or uh, which has been a resolution application that has been passed at, at the stage of COC or at the stage of adjudicating authority. The, has this judgment sort of addressed this question or do you think there will be an after effect that could be created into interpreting IBC possibly in a more rich and, uh, and more cogent manner in this direction? This, this judgment has definitely given a lot of clarity, to be very honest, because they have somewhat, uh, you know, addressed that gray area that was there between the stage of uh, approval from the COC till the timeline of uh, approval by the adjudicating authority. Because, you know, as, as I gave you my example, because my interpretation was also this, that all right, there is a performance guarantee. You may invoke that performance guarantee. But this judgment says that, I'm sorry, it is not just a question of invoking the performance guarantee. You're not allowed to do so. You have to continue with it. But then I also feel that the repercussion of this judgment is that you're forcing something upon a person who is, you know, who's not willing to take it on. Uh, but at present, yes, this is the judgment which stands. And um, this, this has provided a lot of clarity. People who will be now, you know, floating their resolution plans, they must be wary. And which is why it is all the more important that, you know, you do your due diligence properly. And you should know that what you're getting into because many times what happens is that, you know, in the end, what they say is that I'm going as per the information memorandum. If you see the language of the information memorandum, as well as the RFRP, they categorically say that, you know, make sure you do your due diligence properly. And you do not tomorrow say that we have floated a resolution plan only on the basis of this due diligence that was available for us. If required, whatever other sources you may have, you do your due diligence. Although legally speaking, it's not that possible as well, but whatever said and done, the RFRP makes it very clear that this is what it is. You should know what you're getting into. Be wary about it. And again, it's how you put it. It's like a business risk that you're taking. You should be aware that what is the worst that can happen. You, you should be in a position to take on that risk and then say that, all right, worst case scenario, this is what is happening, but I'm still going to go ahead with it. Otherwise, I do agree with also the fact that, you know, if you do allow people to get out of it, then this code will also you know, will be absolutely ineffective. So this judgment, I feel, does clarify it to a large extent. They have addressed that gray issue, that gray area that was there. And uh, I think it's good that people will be, uh, you know, focusing more on the due diligences now. Right, sir. And uh, finally, sir, I think uh, this conversation again would keep going on if I and uh, if I have to limit it to the at the interest of the time. Uh, what do you think when you look back at this judgment? And if there is any after effect repercussions that you can foresee uh, will have an impact on the either the court judgments in the future, possible amendments that can come out, or how the litigating practice around this entire issue would evolve? Is there any repercussion that you see is foreseeable? I think, uh, you know, as, as and when uh, these uh, such judgments come, the parties, uh, let's say to a particular case, they, they always, you know, they're wary of such judgments, the uh, impact of such judgments, and obviously it helps them in dis making their business decisions for that matter. And, uh, you know, going forward, it helps them even draft their resolution plans. As I said earlier, uh, this will definitely have a repercussion in the sense that people will be more wary of the due diligence that they do and they'll be more sure. Now it is, they, they will be certain that if we are getting into this, there is no way of coming out in the event my plan is successful. In the, in the event, sorry, my plan is approved by the COC. Uh, that scope of wriggling out, uh, I feel as per this judgment and as of now until probably there is an amendment by the legislature or if uh, there is a uh, a different uh, opinion given by a coordinate bench, which is then probably referred to a larger bench. Uh, I don't know about that, whether it will happen or not. It's it's not possible to foresee that at present because it's a very well-reasoned judgment as well. So how I see it is that 
one, the gray area is covered. Uh, people will be more uh, conscious of the fact that they cannot wriggle out uh, so easily or they cannot wriggle out. As per this judgment, they'll not be in a position to wriggle out. And uh, the benefit will definitely be, you know, we'll see the effectiveness of this code altogether. This is how I see it. Right. Wonderful, sir. I think uh, I've already sort of uh, taken a lot of your time for this episode, but I'm really grateful uh, that I had this opportunity. This by far is one of the best episodes that I've recorded for this podcast. And it is truly, truly an honor. I think the entire conversation about either the EBIX judgment or in totality, the previous segment that we talked about is definitely going to help a lot of law students. So before we wrap it up, sir, do you have any closing remarks for our viewers? I had a wonderful time, uh, you know, uh, having this conversation with you. And I think you you are very kind. You have, uh, uh, you know, had these talks with some of some very interesting people. I've, I've myself uh, seen your uh, show and it's it's very interesting. And I'm happy to share my experience. If it helps out uh, someone in any way, uh, more the happier. And uh, thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Sir. It was truly an honor for the podcast and for me. I'm really grateful and I'm really looking forward to speaking with you again and hosting you on the podcast one more time. Thank you so much for joining me for this conversation. Definitely and thank you for having me. Thank you so much.